I'm Sean Delaney, and you're listening to What Got You There. What Got You There is a must-follow for entrepreneurs, creatives, high achievers, and change makers. Each week, I sit down with some of the world's most influential people and focus on the journey behind their success. We uncover the strategy, tactics, and routines that help them get there. Now it's your journey, so it's time to learn what's going to get you there. What got you there with Sean Delaney? Uh, what got you there with Sean Delaney? What got you there with Sean Delaney? Uh, what got you there with got you got you? What Life's a long journey. It's uh, sometimes it's not so so easy. So if you're not enjoying what you're doing, the time goes by so slowly. And I think this is where people this is where people get into trouble. You know, because they they get bored because they don't like what they're doing. They they're not passionate about what they're doing. If you're passionate about what you're doing and and good at it. Life is a lot easier. It's just, just is. What got you there with Shonda Laney? When we think of Renaissance men or polymaths, today's guest certainly fits that mold. Jim Cantrell was on the founding team at Elon Musk's SpaceX and was on the founding team of Moon Express. Jim is the founder of several entrepreneurial startups, including Vector Space, Strat Space, and Vintage Exotics Competition Engineering. If that wasn't enough, Jim speaks four languages and spent several years each working in France and in Russia on joint U.S. and Russian defense programs. Jim's career also includes assignments at the French space agency CNES, the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, and has resulted in experience in over 46 satellite flight missions. During this wide-ranging conversation, you'll hear about what it's like to work with Elon Musk, what you can learn about running a business from racing, space exploration, and so much more. Making change transpire. That's the mission behind the most amazing tasting protein bar brand taking the nutrition industry by storm. That brand, they're MCT Co. And they make the most delicious, keto-friendly, all-natural collagen protein bars. If you're obsessed with the quality of food going into your body like I am, then head out and pick up these amazing bars jammed with 10 grams of collagen protein. They only have two to three net carbs, no added sugar, and loaded with high quality MCT oil for the healthy fats from coconuts. Whether you're busy running the kids around from activity to activity, a professional athlete, or just someone looking for a great tasting convenience snack, do yourself a favor, head to mctco.com and use code WGYT for 20% off your order. Jim, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate you taking the time. I know you got in from a, a long day of racing, something we're going to talk a lot about. And I'm actually curious to get started with that. And I mean, you've been involved with this for, for most of your life almost. And, and you've participated in some of the most grueling races, such as the 25 hours of Thunder Hill and 24 hours of Daytona. What is the most challenging race you've been in? Most challenging race? Well, you know, challenges come in different forms, right? Um, in terms of the, the most challenging physically and mentally, it has to be the 25 hours of Thunder Hill. Uh, this is, um, this is a, what we call a pro-am race. It, it's got a mixture of professionals and amateurs. And uh, it's, it's held at uh, Thunder Hill Raceway up in Northern California in early December. So the uh, weather isn't exactly the best for uh, racing in terms of your, your physical comfort. And uh, it, it, it's billed as the longest race in, in North America. So it goes 25 hours. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's an intense experience for the uninitiated. It's an intense experience for the experienced. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a real challenge to keep the, uh, the vehicle intact, keep yourself intact, and uh, to uh, deal with you know, a, a wide variety of speeds of cars on the track. And, uh, you know, we're out there competing with uh, professional Le Mans teams that come to use this as sort of a practice. We've gone up against NASCAR teams that have come out with their, uh, with their trucks and run them. And, uh, you know, some, some, some international winners uh, in, in endurance racing. So, you know, if you're an, an amateur team and amateur drivers, it, it really keeps you on your game. You said it's an intense experience, even for those that are very experienced. So, so I'm curious... What would the casual observer have no idea about, but is something that you guys are constantly thinking about or having to iterate on? So, so the casual observer probably would not have no concept 
that the course between night and day are completely different race courses, not, not physically, but in the way that you have to drive it, in the way that you see it. It's, um, it, it, imagine being on the, uh, the freeway with all the lights coming at you, but you're doing it at about 120 miles an hour. And uh, you, you have to make split second decisions based on lights coming up on you. And you don't have time to really look and assess them. You're making, you're making split second decisions based on how, how fast the light flux is changing and your peripheral vision about whether it's left or right to make the decision to stay out of the guy's way. And uh, it, it's that kind of night day, just, just completely 180 degree difference in conditions that, that I think most people have no idea about. And uh, I know the first time I did night racing uh, was later in my career and, and it was, it was a mind blower at how different it is. And then you throw rain and, and fog and things like that on top of it. Uh, you just can't imagine the, the mental challenge of this whole thing. Yeah, you have a, a unique perspective with that mental challenge. And a minute ago, you mentioned decision making. I'm intrigued about how racing has improved your overall decision making in life. You know, that's a really great question. Um, and uh, there's probably a book in, in the answer to this <laughs> question. Uh, seriously, uh, I, I wrote an article one time called The Five Things I Learned from Racing, and uh, it's all about this topic. And uh, really, there's a, a number of things that come out of racing for me personally. I don't know about others, but we speak, you know, much the same, most of the others who, who are in this business. Uh, first is uh, that it, it creates an enormous sense of self-confidence that it's very hard to explain for those who haven't experienced it. Um, as, as we're talking about, you know, split second decision making, sort of the grit and determination to continue when you think everything is lost. Um, you know, you, you go out on these, particularly these endurance races, and I, I'm the team owner in, in my case and uh, driver as well, you know, and I'll have $25,000, dollars $100,000 invested in one event, depending on what we're doing. And it may not be all my money. I maybe have customers that are buying seats and so on or sponsors, but, you know, it's a significant amount of money. And so everything has to be perfect. The preparations have to be there. So to be able to, to do that and to take the enormous physical risk as well as fiscal risks alongside each other, just it gives you this sense of, uh, I won't say invulnerability, but that you can deal with whatever comes along and you can use your logic and your power of um, power of thought to work your way through problems. And, and if you don't have that calm, icy demeanor in the middle of a, a race like that, whether you're driver or crew, uh, to solve these problems, you know, nothing goes right. So, so that translates into all other aspects of your life. I mean, literally all other aspects, because sometimes when bad things happen, either personally or in business, I you know, I use that analogy of a race. Like uh, I recently went through a uh, startup that had gone like gangbusters for four years and then, and then suddenly fell out because the main investor pulled out. And it, to me, it was like uh, I, I ran a car into, into the wall in the corner. So the question was what to do next. And uh, for, for me, it was, okay, well, you're still alive. You're, you're fine. You still got a car, go rebuild it and get back in the race. You know, maybe, maybe this race is over. Maybe, maybe it's not. By the time you get out there, so so that that's really the uh, the number one thing, and then and then the other the other thing that comes behind it is is just sort of the spirit of competitiveness, and it and it it, it bleeds over into the rest of your life. You know, it, it it gives you this sense of wanting to win, wanting to dominate, wanting to wanting to improve, and. It's, it's, it's been one of the, the most um, positive influences on my life uh, that I, I can point to, period. I'd like to circle back to that calm nature and the power of thought. And, and you mentioned a recent startup that, that took a turn for the negative. So were you able to remain much more calm in that situation because of racing? I think so. Um, in fact, uh, my board um, of directors when uh, things were starting to go to hell, I was so calm. They accused me of not caring. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I had to, I had to point out to them, you know, look, uh, I've been in situations where my life's been threatened driving 200 miles an hour on Daytona and the car starts to spin. That gets me excited, you know, that, that we have to, 
figure out this problem doesn't deserve that 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 level of adrenaline. Um, so so pardon me while I'm just trying to solve the problem. And um, yeah, it's uh, I I think emotion is good, of of course, and I certainly am the kind of person that feels a lot of them, but. Uh, it, it, it doesn't necessarily help you make better decisions all the time. And I, I think, uh, at least for me personally, as I've gone from being younger to much older, the emotion and the effect of emotions on, on decisions has become less and less of a, of a factor. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things I think a lot of people make the, the most serious mistakes in their lives is by uh, allowing emotion to... to color the facts. And, you know, this whole business of being able to look at the facts as you have them and make the right set of decisions, you know, based on what you can see is very important. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's the emotional part is coming to accept the fact that these facts are what they are. <laughs> and uh, it's all again about like racing, you know, once you hit the wall and I've done it a few times, the reality is you've hit the wall. There's nothing you can do to change that. You can't deny it. You, you can't, you know, excuse it. You can't do anything. Okay. Something went wrong. Either you ran out of talent or something, you know, external to what you're doing is wrong or an unexpected condition. So go fix it. And then, you know, if you're going to get emotional about it, you don't belong in the sport. Yeah. I've never been behind the wheel of a race car, so I might be off in this, but I'm wondering just prior to hitting that wall, when there are things that are still in your control, to help prevent that, how do you remain calm so you can clearly think during those times? So I can only speak for myself. Um, other people I talk to kind of give me similar experiences. Your mind is going so fast um, when things are starting to go wrong at those speeds. In fact, I, I would say your mind is going so fast at those speeds, period, that it seems like reality slows down. And it seems cliche to say this, but it's it's like a lot of those uh, Hollywood movies where you see, you know, the, the the super action character, you know, moving in slow motion. That that's the way it seems to you at the time, and so you're literally thinking this thing through as it's happening because your mind is moving so fast. And and people say, you know, that, that are experts on the human mind that we only use something like ten percent of our intellect. And uh, it, it's times like this that you realize that's really true that your mind is capable of so much more processing. Uh, the only thing I've heard people describe that's similar to this is combat where you're getting shot at and uh, never, you know, had the, uh, I won't say the pleasure to be in that, but I've never had that experience. And, uh, but, but I hang around with a lot of guys who have, and uh, they talk about the same sort of thing. This, 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 this absolute deluge of information coming coming at you all at once and you're processing it. So people often mistake um, racing as being an adrenaline junkie event. It's actually not. Uh, I always tell people the adrenaline happens after you screw up. And that's the truth. Cause you know, when, when you're doing it, you're in survival mode and yeah, the adrenaline's flowing for sure. And your heart rates up and all that. But, but when you get the shakes from the adrenaline, that that's usually afterwards when you can afford it. I'm intrigued by that processing power, mentioning using using only about 10% of your brain. Are there other activities uh, that you've done in your life where you realize the potential of the human brain? Yeah, it's uh, startups are like that, <laughs> which is why there's a there's a commonality here. You know, I uh, in my life I have worked for very few people. Uh, some say because. Uh, nobody can stand to have me around very long. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is, you know, I'm, I'm addicted to the action, right? I like to, I like to move fast and I like to, uh, you know, take territory that nobody else has taken, or at least nobody else is, is going to take. And, uh, startups kind of provide that same thing because you have, you know, sparse information coming at you like markets, um, you know, who's going to invest, um, you, you have to have faith in yourself. You have to be confident that you can win this thing. You have to think it all through. And then during, during the uh, engagement, you know, that, that, that we call the startup phase, you know, there, there's a lot of decisions that have to be made very, very, very quickly. And so, so for me, that's one of the commonality pieces between racing and startups. And that, 
you know, I think it's the same, same thing. Uh, just, just, uh, maybe a little bit less dangerous to your body in the case of a startup, but probably more dangerous to your wallet. I mean, the, the danger to your wallet in racing is known and calibrated. Uh, the startup can be uh, maybe uncalibrated. It seems that you have a great understanding of how you operate best. And I don't know if this is just due to time or if you've put a lot of effort into, into understanding how you operate and what makes you tick. Which one is it? Oh, it's probably the latter, you know, um, just a, just a personal, um, a story, you know, my, my, my father, my biological father was, a, was an alcoholic. And, uh, when you grow up with an alcoholic father, you become hyper aware of what's going on around you. And then, uh, you know, because you, you, as a child, you, you don't want people to know that, you know, your father's an alcoholic. You don't want, uh, people to think that, uh, you know, everything's coming apart in your life when every night you go home and, and it is. And so you, you learn to read people very, very, very well around you. Uh, the, the sort of second phase of a recovering child of an alcoholic, and I never went to any of those classes, but what it really is, is um, your, your ability to hyper read yourself as a result. Because, you know, after you've sort of gotten out of those situations and you're an adult, you start to find that you have behaviors that have, have resulted from this. And unless you figure them out on your own, uh, you don't, you don't really, um, you really don't know what's driving you. And, and a lot of these things are very hidden. They're, they're emotional, like we talked about earlier. And, uh, you know, once you've thought them through, if you're that kind of self-aware person, you, you begin to understand what really makes yourself tick. And, uh, most of us, I think, are not really creatures that enjoy pain. Um, <laughs> there are there are exceptions uh, among among us, but most of us avoid the pain. And so, you know, when life deals uh, certain situations with you, you try to avoid the pain. And part of that is uh, understanding what your own motivations are. So that's what I attribute it to, really. Yeah, I've spent a great deal of time trying to understand my own motivations and assessing my own behavior. So I'm wondering what you, your practice looked like when you were doing this. Is it just something you thought of or were you writing these things down? Anything like that? Mostly thinking. Um, you know, I, uh, as, as, a, uh, as a teenager, I was a mess. You know, I, I did drugs. I, uh, you know, I, I raced go-karts. That was one of, the, one of the things that kind of kept me sane. I raced cars. Um, and cars actually were probably the thing that kept me out of the, out of the bars and out of the drugs even further, you know? So, uh, there, there was a point in time where self-evaluation wasn't even possible and it wasn't until I got to college and I almost failed in engineering school. Mind you, I, I came from a, a, a very, uh, uh, modest family with no means to pay for my college. So I had to, I had to work to pay for it. So to fail at that was not an option. And I think, um, I think that's really where where it started, and it, it, it came down to a necessity to figure out, you know, why, for example, I chose electrical engineering when I hated it, and why why I didn't choose mechanical engineering where I clearly loved mechanical, it, it, and things like that. So it, it over time, uh, I, I found sort of a form of meditation. Everybody has their own form of meditation, and, and mine became really twofold. One was long drives across country. <laughs> and uh, uh, if I get really big problems to solve, sometimes I'll take a four or five day drive across the country. Yeah, nothing better than West Texas to be alone with your thoughts. Uh, if you've ever driven it, you know what I mean. Yeah, and the other thing is music, frankly. I find music very meditative and uh, it, it, it's gotta be the right kind of music. You know, uh, while I love Rammstein, you know, I don't find it meditative for the most part. I find it motivating, but you know, there's other forms of music and I like it all. I, I except probably country Western. I, I probably like every form of music from opera to heavy metal. So, so that's, uh, that's pretty much, you know, how, how it puts my mind in that state. And, and there is a state, you know, I, it's funny. I think people don't use opportunities to really think that are presented to them. Um, this, this, uh, recently I, well, I'm always on an airplane and uh, I was on an airplane from Las Vegas 
here. It was a nice short hour and a half flight, but it's over the Grand Canyon and so on. And uh, I sat next to somebody who all they wanted to do was talk, right? They, they just wanted to engage. And it wasn't a particularly interesting person, uh, but they liked to hear themselves talk, I think. And uh, I wanted to uh, I wanted to look out the window and enjoy the scenery and think. And so uh, my, my self-defense was a set of headphones. I finally could get this person to stop. But I actually feel sorry for people who, who can't, uh, you know, be introspective, right? It, it's, it's such a, such a useful thing. And I, I guess they just like to hear the noise all the time of their own speech, something like that. So uh, it, it's, you know, I go to Finland a lot. And uh, one of the things I like about the Finns is they don't like to talk much. And they actually will talk about how they're happy with their spouse to just be quiet together. <laughs> I, I'm really intrigued about inflection points. And it, it almost seems like this was a math problem. Just adding everything up, it's incredibly rare that you ended up where you are. So, so yeah. I, I'm intrigued about your selection for electrical engineering. Oh, yeah, that was my stepfather. He, um, uh, he was an electrical engineer in Silicon Valley. So I went to high school in Silicon Valley and did the Stanford summer programs and things like that. And I probably should have followed that path and, and gone to uh, Stanford and been one of those Silicon Valley type people. But uh, if, if you know me and you see the grease under my fingernails, you know, I don't fit into that crowd very well. And uh, somehow I just never, just never felt like I belonged there. Uh, but, but uh, you know, we ended up in Utah for reasons that are odd. Um, I wasn't part of the, you know, the dominant religion in Utah either, but um, you know, the, the school uh, that, that I went to Utah state had a pretty good engineering program. And the only thing I knew in engineering really was my stepfather who was an electrical engineer. So I just emulated him. Right. And I built, my own stereo system when I was like 13 years old, I we couldn't afford it. So I decided to go down to the library and get a book and figure out how they, how they work. Cause I wanted a hundred watt per channel stereo. And back in the, you know, the late seventies, early eighties, you just, you just couldn't buy those. Right. And so after years, I eventually made it work. I still have it today. Um, I probably spent a whole lot more money than it would have taken to buy one, I guess. But uh, you know, that whole experience said, Hey, why not electrical? Right. And uh, the feedback for me was, you're doing poorly. <laughs> you don't, you don't enjoy the the classes, you know. And, and when they got into state machines and and things like that, I, I, I couldn't stand it. I loved uh, programming computers. I loved the physics. Uh, the math was hard. Um, but then one one day, I had this friend Larry who who uh, knew me pretty well. He's a mechanical engineer, and, and he at lunch he just said, he said. Jim, why are you why are you an electrical engineer? You're a gearhead. You should be over with us. And that, that was just like something I never thought of, right? So I so I went over and, and you know my grades went from failing literally to uh, doing quite well. So I, I managed to get myself into graduate school. Um, you know I had to go on probation because I had a two point nine because of my earlier electrical stuff. But you know in grad school in uh, mechanical and aerospace engineering, I graduated. With, 3.98 so prove that i you know wasn't dumb after all yeah i i want to circle back to to your ability to learn new skills and bring on new knowledge but but i know you you continue to bring up about being a gearhead and you mentioned loving to drive cross country so two-part question here if there could only be one more car you get to drive cross country what would it be and then also what would be the favorite pick ever on the racetrack <laughs> Yeah, so so that's that's a really good question. So I've always had this fantasy uh, about driving a uh, F Ferrari Testarossa from the '50s across country. You know, it's it's a classic uh, classic kind of race car that uh, you know. Uh, I don't know if you saw the, uh, the the Art of Racing in the Rain movie, but in the end, when he took Enzo for a ride around the track, that's that's what he was driving. And uh, I don't know somehow the idea of you know, here in the, here in the wind and, uh, and, uh, you know, days and days of that sort of a manly experience, I guess. Um, and then, uh, you know, as far as, as far as the, the car on the track, you know, I, I've been fortunate in my life to have driven a lot of cars on the track. And, uh, the, the ones though, that I haven't been able to experience 
are the modern GTP cars or the, or the Daytona prototypes. So yeah, I would uh, I would sacrifice a lot to go do that. What's been the most unique ex- driving experience on the track? Has there been a, a car that just when you're behind the wheel is unlike anything else? You know, th- there cars. I this will sound very funny to you, but I I actually think they're living beings, living creatures. They, especially the race cars because they 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 come an embodiment of those who built it and those who worked on it. It's, it's as if we live leave uh, our, our DNA and our blood behind. We literally do leave our blood on the machines sometimes. But uh, they have personality. Some of them are evil. Some of them are kind. Some of them are sneaky. Some of them are just plain, you know, like a horse that won't stop. And uh, some of them, though, uh, become old friends. And uh, I have two in particular that, that uh, I have to say, Every time I get in them, it's just it's it's like I'm with an old friend that I'm so comfortable with. I have this old Corvette GT1, which is a tube frame race car that I compete nationally with, and uh, I, I call it Trash Wagon because uh, it was built by a guy named Peter Deuce, who, like me, he didn't you know have the money to do these things. And back you know when uh, pro racing allowed uh, amateurs to enter, he 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 built this on his garage floor of his. Uh, auto body shop up in Massachusetts. And he, he, he did very well nationally gets, you know, uh, a lot of the pros and at the time. And, uh, I, I ended up with a car and you sit in it and it's just, it, it, you feel, you feel all of Peter's work. You know, the car just seems to love you. And, and when you drive it, the car feels like an extension of your body. And that that's hard to explain to people. But other drivers I've talked to have have experienced this too, that literally it's as if your hands become the front tires and and it's it's a metaphysical experience that I, you know, I'm not a really religious guy, but, you know, you feel stuff like this and you're like, what was that? (laughs) Did you feel, you know, first time it happened to me in this car, I I about drove off the track. I was like, what was that? And then, then over time I've learned that, you know, when you get there, that that's, when you see some of these magical drives, like there's, you know, Ayrton Senna was one of these guys who, who did this. You, you can see it, that he becomes one with the car. And just to watch him maneuver this machine at such high speed, it's magic. And um, there's other drivers, you know, the, the famous drives you can see on YouTube where people do this, some of the rally drivers in this way. So that for me, that's, that's you know, all the technical interest is fine, but, those cars that, that touch you, that, that become one with you, they're rare. You mentioned there were two. The first was the Corvette. You, you never mentioned the second. What's the second one that you have that bond with? Yeah, it's a Shelby Can-Am. So Carroll Shelby, now we're all knowing who Carroll Shelby is these days, and that's really a good thing. I'm glad, you know, with the movie uh, Ford versus Ferrari. And they can get a real appreciation for the genius of the man. And, uh, you know, he built... Um, about 70 of these uh, cars as, as feeders for the Indianapolis 500 uh, crowd in the Indy, Indy car series. And uh, they're very fast um, cars that, that are made of steel tube frames. So uh, they're, they're uh, single seaters and open cockpit and uh, very big engines. They'll go you know, a couple hundred miles an hour and so forth. Um, this one we converted to a Ford engine, uh, took, took the little or Dodge engine out with a big Ford in it. And uh, it, it just has that that same feel. And I, I feel safe in it because it's a steel frame instead of a carbon fiber thing. So that's a mental thing for me. You know, I like to be surrounded by steel, not carbon fiber and fiberglass. But uh, it, again, this one, you're exposed to the elements on it. So it's even more so, you know, that this, this ability to sort of put yourself as part of the car. It's like you, you become, uh, uh, you know, one of those movie creatures with the Camaro that turns into the, into the alien, you know, you, you literally feel like that. It, it, this one is probably the one I felt that the most with, but you know, trash wagon is the one I have the most intense love for. Yeah. I mentioned no experience here with racing, which is why I love these types of questions where you get to hear your perspective and, and almost the beauty and elegance you find in these things. So this is, this is a real treat for me to get to hear that. Sure. We, we were talking a few minutes ago, just about learning and, I take it you're someone incredibly adept 
in terms of, of taking on new skills? I mean, you speak four languages, launch multiple businesses, sit on many boards. Are there any particular frameworks that, that you've kind of based new knowledge acquisition on? Uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Um, I've never thought about it formally. You know, I mean, it, I guess I would just say it started, you know, when I was a young kid and uh, I would I would just devour any information I could get my hands on. And, you know, I'm, I'm mid 50s. So when I was young, we had no Internet. Uh, we had encyclopedias. And my, my mother bought me an encyclopedia set, which I still have behind me in my office here. I, I, I tease my kids. I said, this is the early internet. And uh, I, I literally used to read them. I, I would just spend summers, you know, if I got interested in the subject, I would look it up and read about it. And, uh, you know, I, I got in a cab uh, this weekend and uh, the guy was from Eritrea and he was surprised I knew where Eritrea was. And uh, it's because I read about it in the, and encyclopedias when I was a kid, and I've always been interested in some certain things. So it, it it's I think it's a thirst for knowledge, to be honest. And I, if you're not thirsty for knowledge, um, I, I, I feel bad for you. I'll just put it that way. Um, I, I think thirst for knowledge is what makes us humans who we are, and it's something that uh, you know it it, it helps us uh, grow. It helps us advance. It helps us. I don't know. It's a reason to live for me. And, uh, you know, so I, with the internet, it's even, well, it's, it's, it's a good and a bad thing because there's so much information now that you can get lost in it. Right. Uh, but still the, the ability for humanity to put its entire knowledge base in, in one place that's accessible by everybody in the world, almost literally is stunning. And if you go back to, Historical times, um, like I, I've taken a tour of Ephesus in, in Turkey, which is where the Ephesians lived, you know, around the time of Christ. And, uh, you know, the, the, the library that was there was taken to Alexandria. You know, it used to be that these things were sacred, that this knowledge was sacred, and it was controlled and held. And, you know, even within communist regimes, which I have my share of experiences with, you know, this is, this is what they did was they controlled this. So, so part of my, I would say my, my you know, philosophy in life too, is to help bring and share this, this uh, accessibility of, of knowledge to the entire world. I think it improves our human condition, period. You know, I tell my kids, you know, if, if your life's in, in the dumps, you know, work hard and go learn something new. I mean, I, I think that's our only, it's our only real source of hope in, in the world. Yeah, you and I are, are operating from the same perspective there. You, you mentioned almost the, the good and the bad uh, of the internet and, and what we're able to access. Uh, I'm wondering then, your, your current thirst for knowledge, are you someone who is endlessly fascinated by a wide array of topics, or do you tend to go yeah. really, really deep into one or two? No, I'm, I'm, to my own detriment, probably fascinated by too many things. <laughs> I, have, I have two more languages I'm learning at the moment, and uh, you know I probably should, should stick with just one and then move to the next, but that's not how my mind works. So then talking to someone who, who's younger than you and their mind tends to operate the same way. Any advice? <laughs> Discipline, my friend. <laughs> no, 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 it's too funny. So, so you mentioned your reading of the encycl encyclopedias when you were younger. Are you still a voracious reader? And if so, in your adult yeah. life, what do you uh, tend to read the most? Yeah, so, uh, this is funny. You know, my, my wife is... Uh, retired. She was, uh, you know, a Raytheon engineer, was in charge of software for the kill vehicles, the, you know, the missile defense system. And uh, when she retired, she's done, right? And she, she reads a lot of fiction. And all I can read is nonfiction, right? It, it's history. It's military history. It's, it's, you know, how I've got right now the history of liquid rocket engines I'm reading because it's fascinating to me. And uh, so it's, it's almost never fiction. I, I rarely engage in fiction, although I love it. I just don't have time for it. So it's usually military history or history of weapon systems or something like that. I, I don't know why I'm so interested in that, but I am. Yeah. Anyone who'd want to go further on one of those topics, any books that come to mind for you, you'd recommend? Um, well, uh <laughs> That's a, that's a really interesting question. No, I can't think of anything off the top of my head 
um, that uh, you know comes to mind. Um, but you know, it, it's uh, it, it's mainly European uh, history, World War II history that kind of interests me. So there's just a smattering of stuff out there. Um, the, the Devil's Horseman uh, was one on uh, the, the cons and, and how they swept through Asia and then later Europe that, that does stick out as probably one of those seminal pieces that uh, if you want to understand how ancient history connects with modern European problems, that, that's probably one of the more interesting ones that, that sticks to mind. Any other, I don't necessarily want to limit this to books, but just overall references in terms of how you live that, that you've really extracted from things you've discovered throughout history? You're speaking of books? Yeah, it could be books. It could be overall philosophies, such as a, a samurai philosophy, um, a yeah. military strategist, a, anything okay. of that nature. Yeah, so I, you, you touched on it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of what, what's known as the Bushido Code. And I became very fascinated with uh, Japanese military history, not just World War II, but when you go back to the feudal system and, and, uh, and the, the samurai and, and how that evolved. And uh, what I discovered, to my surprise, was that the samurai had a code of honor that uh, really synced with sort of my view of the world, one, one uh, philosophy that really balances you know, one's own responsibility uh, to society, to yourself, to others who, who are loyal to you, and also with, you know, sort of the fierceness of character that you need to survive in the world. And so there's uh, seven, seven basic virtues of, of the Bushido Code. You know, there's, there's justice, there's uh, kindness, there's uh, truth, uh, there's fierceness, uh, loyalty, and so on. And uh, if, you, if you read through it, it's more than just words. It's, it's, it's a way to live. And, uh, I find, uh, a lot of my, a lot of my colleagues who, who come from the special forces and so on, uh, have also been attracted to this. So I'm, I'm not alone in that, but, uh, you know, I, I've read a lot of, uh, a lot of the Eastern Asian, uh, texts, you know, like, uh, the Tao Te Ching and, uh, the art of war, Sun Tzu's art of war. Sun Tzu's art of war is really awesome. Nobody really knows who the real author of that is. And so that's kind of an interesting thing. But, uh, you know, the ancients really, really understood things. And uh, that, that's that been sort of the surprise for me is how little has really changed in basic human behavior for thousands and thousands of years. Yeah, I'm always intrigued by that as well. I'm wondering, though, is there anything that you've noticed has actually changed fundamentally? Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, our, our accessibility to, to knowledge and our ability to communicate as a species is so fundamentally different that we haven't even begun to understand the implications of that. And it could be very bad, uh, or it could be very good, or some combination of the two. But if you look back on history, uh, you know, if people look at this time in human history, I believe they'll, they'll see a couple of things, you know, yeah, they'll say, oh yeah, you know, they invented nuclear weapons and you know, they could kill more people and that sort of thing. Um, they fought some big wars, but really they'll see this as, as the beginning of the information revolution. And that kind of thinking, I've, or that kind of effect, I've already seen affecting my children. I have six children, you know, four by my own hand and two by, by my second marriage. And, uh, the, the, you know, the youngest is 18. And I'm, I'm seeing that they relate to the world in a fundamentally different way than I do. And uh, maybe this is part of me just getting old and looking back on my life and saying, well, it was nicer back when. But, you know, when, when I was a kid, we, you know, we went out to the neighborhood. I would tell my mother, hey, I'm going to Richie's house and be back by, you know, dinner time, 4.30. And, and uh, you know, you, you didn't have to be tracked. You didn't. You went out and did these things, and there was there was almost this autonomy that you can't have now. The whole world is connected; they're tracked. Everybody's tracked, and uh, everybody's having data collected on them. Try as you might, and I don't like it, but try as you might, you can't get rid of it. It's just not going to happen. And I think it changes the way humans think. I think this is one of the first times in history where this much information 
this much computing power is going to change the human species in, in a very fundamental way and uh, how we relate to the world. So, so that is, is, is the big change. And as you mentioned earlier, the internet's good and bad. And I, I don't think that the outcome of this is well understood at all. Do you have any insights into how this might play? I, I have an 18 month old son, so I'm wondering what it looks like <laughs> when, when, when he's 25, 30, 35. Well, your your eighteen month old son, probably at the age of three, will pick up a computer and can know how to use it. Oh, it's 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 unbelievable. He'll uh, he'll yeah. pick up my iPad or iPhone. He already knows how to use it. Voice control, everything. It's unbelievable how quickly they they adapt to this. There, there's various theories as to why this happens. I maintain we don't really know, right? But it's very clear that that these children are already adapting to this new reality and. For me, I can't even begin to tell you how shocking this is for me because my first computer was in graduate school. You know, it was a it was a big mainframe uh, that that we had a program with cards, card readers. You know, so for me, the idea of being able to use these things is is just so foreign at that age. You know, I I'm, I'm very good with computers today because I've, I'm a lifelong learner, but that that children can pick this up is just stunning. And uh, says to me, uh, I won't say our brains are getting rewired, but there, there's something deep going on here that none of us really understand. And I think their children's children will surprise them in, in the same way because this explosion is exponential. And, and that's why I mean it's so fundamental is because it builds on itself. And, uh, you, you know, you, you watch... You know, politics is everybody complains about how politics have become what it is. Part of that is is because it's everywhere all the time, twenty four seven, and you know people can go on this thing called Twitter and make their own their own national headlines with it. And Twitter's the the, uh, the the mouthpiece of our government now. You know, like it or not, that's the way it's going to be going forward. And uh, this this just changes everything. It's it's so different than it ever was. And, uh, you know, the libertarians will tell you that it's um, terrible tyranny, you know, but, but I also look at it as, well, you know, okay, citizens are being watched. Everybody knows what happens. On the other hand, you know, we can equally watch the governments, right? So there's, there's more accountability of our so-called leaders uh, to, to their, their actions being exposed. And if you really think about it, they are exposed more and more all the time. Thinking about this, this thirst for knowledge, how, how young people are, are learning today, I, I've heard you mention that you believe that intelligence is only a fraction of the ingredients needed to succeed. Yeah. It, can you expand upon this? I, I would love to just dive into this with you. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm not the first to say this, so it's not really an original. But yeah, people people often think that uh, you know, you, you, making money is, by the way, your your ultimate objective. It's not. And uh, when you say successful, the question is how do you how do you how do you measure success? And usually, you know, money is a byproduct of value you create. It's a reflection of the value you've created. So, so people um, people focus on that. But the reality is, to be successful, you have to do something you love. Uh, you have to be good at it, and it has to be something that people want. So, so it's really that simple. And a lot of people just plain forget it. It's rare you run into people that build a widget that nobody wants. Uh, sometimes they turn into Steve Jobs, and uh, he's building this widget called the iPhone that nobody wanted, and then they all wanted it. You know, there, there are some people who are transformative with this, but they're kind of rare people, right? You don't you don't see a lot of those people, um, or, or they do it just for their self their self uh, uh, pleasure, if you will. Uh, you know, in the in the case of building rare cars. I, I, I was just reading about a car this morning that made it to Pebble Beach, which is the world's you know most prestigious event in the world. And I thought it was the ugliest thing I'd ever seen. It was one guy's interpretation of what a car ought to be, right? So I thought that must have been a weird duck. I was reading that thinking, I wonder why everybody thought Hobart was such a such a brilliant man, because I, I think it's ugly. But at any rate, each his own, and it's like art, I guess. Uh, you know, and then... then uh, being good at it and being passionate about it kind of go hand in hand, you know, it, life's a long journey. It's, uh, and, and it, sometimes it's not so, so easy. So if you're not enjoying what you're doing, the time goes by so slowly 
And I think this is where people, this is where people get into trouble, you know, because they, they get bored because they don't like what they're doing. They, they experiment with drugs, they experiment with it. You know, fine, if you experiment with drugs, fine, you go do it. But I, I maintain that's probably not what's what's going to provide humanity's movement forward. Uh, you know, so, so they, they, they cheat on their spouses. They all do all these things because they're not passionate about what they're doing. If you're passionate about what you're doing and, and good at it, life is a lot easier. It's just, just is. So with my children, you know, I've been very uh, firm with them to say, look, you know, your most important thing is to find out what it is you're passionate about and what it is you're good at. And, uh, and to go with that. And sometimes it's, it's a subtle twist of how you look at things to sort of see that, you know, because, uh, you know, let's say it's art that you're, you're passionate about and you're good at it. Well, you know, who's buying art, if you, you know, you just build your art. Well, there's, there's a lot of ways you can make money at it. So you got to twist that angle of it. And uh, cause the reality is we have to, we have to all earn money in this world by creating value. So that part of, you know, our responsibility to human species is always there. So, uh, so, so society has its way of working you through that, but, um, that that's the tough part. And it isn't always what, what I've done. And, you know, I have maybe one of my kids that's in engineering. I've got another who, I guess my, my son who's into cryptocurrency has his own alt currency. He, uh, he's probably followed closely in my steps of being independent and technical. So, uh, but my, my youngest daughter probably is the only other one. The rest of them artistic, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, who knows, right? It's, it's all okay. Yeah, it's funny how that works out. I, I'm one of four children, and all four of us are on complete opposite ends of the spectrum. It's funny how that ends up that way. You were mentioning someone like Steve Jobs, one of those rare transformative people. Who else do you view throughout history as, as those transformative people? I'm always interested how you perceive things and how you think about this. Yeah, well, let's start with some, some others who are alive right now. Um, Elon Musk is clearly transformative, and and I'll I'll tell you, I didn't see that when I first was with him. Uh, I saw that over time, um, but he he clearly has, and he doesn't like it when I say this, but I'll say it anyhow. Uh, he clearly has sort of these huge goals in mind for humanity that I think you know his his life goal is 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 to be recognized for contribution to humanity in an outside in an outsized way and uh, you know he talks about humanity as, as a multi-planetary species that was his first phone call to me was all about this and i've heard him say it you know a hundred times since then or more and it never changes right and, and that's the thing about him he when he was very young he thought these things up and he and i had a similar kind of childhood in a way you know he uh was in South Africa, and and even Elon didn't have the internet. Um, you know, there were billboards and things like that, so we had to find our knowledge. Otherwise, he was a voracious reader. He was a bit socially isolated. You know, I I, uh, I didn't like most of my friends when I was young, so I kind of kept to myself and and uh, you know built my stuff and, and stayed in you know in my room and read when I was a kid. And uh, so so was Elon, and uh, so. So uh, he decided early on what he wanted to do and he stuck with it. And, you know, his other one that he always told me was he wanted to change humanity from a fossil fuel consuming society to one with sustainable energy. And although he didn't found Tesla, you know, he invested and turned it into what's now the most valuable automotive company in the world, which shocks me. I mean, he's done things that have literally shocked me, um, but he's a difficult guy to be around. And, not that he's a bad person at all, quite the opposite. Um, he's just he's just so demanding of people around him because he needs them to be 100% aligned with his vision. So in my own case, that's why I you know parted ways with him because I'm I'm way too uh, persnickety of a person and too independent. Um, so decided that early on, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, then if you go back in time, I really truly believe you know, in terms of industrialists, the uh, turn of last century, the, the turn of the 20th century, uh, particularly in Detroit, was it was a very fundamentally formative period. And if you look at Henry Ford, Henry Ford, despite being a, a real hardcore right-wing bastard from all accounts, had this sort of almost socialist core about him where he, 
he wanted to change the the way uh, that, that the industrial revolution was going and make it more accessible to the average person. So he created both a living wage among his own staff and then mass production created the automobile, which would free the average uh, the average citizen to have more mobility, right? The very sort of noble goals, um, made a lot of money at it, and that was good. But he was he was really the guy, I think, that transformed the modern industrial era in, in, in a very positive way. And if you go back to World War II, uh, you know, the reason we beat the Germans, in my opinion, I mean, they made some strategic blunders of orders of magnitude that were horrible. Uh, the, the real reason we beat them was just simple mass production. The German uh, weapons of war were superior in almost every way, but very inferior in number and sometimes very uh, 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 cantankerous to maintain and so forth. And so, you know, we would put out 10 Sherman tanks for every one of their, their panzers and, uh, you know, just sheer numbers killed them all off. So, uh, you know, without Henry Ford and the industrialization, we would not have had the industrial capacity to do what we did. Most people don't realize that, you know, in, in World War II, the government, U.S. government came in, shut down uh, industrial production for consumer goods and turned it all into war production. And that's almost unthinkable today. It, it is just, it's a, it's a reality. It's hard to believe, but to really reverse the course of history that it was going, you know, this is what happened. And so, so I really credit Henry Ford, ironically, with uh, saving the world in that sense. And, and, I, and I see that as a, a major positive factor. So, you know, if, if you go back to uh, earlier than that, uh, one of my favorite historical figures is Christopher Columbus. And uh, even though he knew the world wasn't square and he wasn't gonna fall off the edge of it, <laughs> if you can imagine getting on a boat, and, and, I, and I've gone across the Atlantic on boat several times, that's a long journey and you get on a sailing ship and to just go where the winds take you basically and having faith that there's something over there that you'll run into and almost running out of food by the time you get there, that, 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 that embodies the human spirit. Right. So, so those are, those are some of the, the folks. And then of course, uh, you know, Neil Armstrong and, and, and Buzz Aldrin, I actually know Buzz personally, uh, those guys, same thing. I mean, they're that spirit of exploration, standing on the moon, being the first humans to step off the surface of the earth. You know, I, I can't wait for the next, what I think will be the most famous person in human history will be the first human born off of the earth, whether it be the moon or Mars, I don't know, but that'll happen. And that goes back to Elon Musk. I think that's really where, where he's going. He's now talking about millions of people to Mars and, you know, in the early days, he used to, when we were talking about building rockets ourselves, you know, we had a hard enough sell with that, let alone uh, talking about Mars bases. And he used to bring me, you know, Mars base drawings that he had somebody doing. And I'd say, look, put that away. That's like talking about aliens. You know, let's, let's, let's not do that right now. But here he is, you know. So so I think uh, I think the future is very interesting to, to see in, in our lifetime. How far off do you think that is, someone being born on Mars? Oh, I think it's very, very much in, in the possibility of my lifetime. Uh, certainly, you're a little bit younger than me. I think it's even more likely in your lifetime. Yeah, we we do live at a fascinating time. You mentioned Columbus setting off in the ship. If, if we were looking back on history, what is most applicable to today? Yeah, it's that spirit of adventure. It's that spirit of, of discovery. And, uh, you know, that that's the one thing that's always kept humanity moving you go back to, you know, depending on your view of how humanity originated, uh, but if you believe archaeology, which I do, you know, humanity, the, the Homo sapiens emerged out of Africa and spread. And that spread was simply, you know, probably to get away from your enemy, uh, but more likely, as Carl Sagan would say, to search for more fertile hunting grounds over the hill. And uh, it, it's that it's that spread that there's a part of our society now that, that thinks that that's bad. I was reading yesterday where some Harvard professor thinks the best way to deal with global warming is exterminate humanity. Uh, that, that, yeah, exactly. I don't even know how to address that. So um, at any rate, that's probably the most evil thought I've ever had in my life put into my head, you know. Uh, but uh, this, this expansion of humanity is what 
I think brings the magic to us. And, and we as a species, we are human and we are, we are wanderers. We are discoverers. And, uh, man, if we're not doing that, I don't think we're alive. I, I just don't think we're alive and we're doomed to, doomed to die on this planet if we don't. So thinking about seeing things that others don't, you mentioned you didn't see it in Elon to begin with. What did you miss there? And then has that changed how you view new opportunities? We're, we're going to get into a minute about how you've gone about building certain teams. So I'm wondering how that pattern recognition has changed over time. It's it's impossible to know how many billions of dollars I've stepped over in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, I realize several of them already, but you know, again, I've already established that money's not the big outcome for me. So I guess that's okay by my own definition. Um, so, so with Elon, it was interesting. And, and this has been true of almost everybody I've met that would be considered quote unquote famous. That includes people like Carl Sagan and some of my early bosses who were, who helped put men on the moon, Buzz Aldrin, for example, Buzz a little different because I met him, you know, post event. But when you meet these people, uh, and, and you don't know any better, they seem very ordinary. Um, th th there's nothing sort of magical. In fact, Elon, when he first called me, I, I thought he was a lunatic, to be honest, you know, the way he was talking and, and so on. And it wasn't until I started to listen to him, I said, oh, okay, this guy, he's got some real ideas. And, you know, they, they seem quite different than mine. <laughs> but the difference was he had money. And, and I always looked at, at uh, money, again, as a reflection of value creation. So, so it's not that I respected money per se, but I respected what it represented. And so was more than happy to listen to this net. Now, that being said, I've met a, a number of people who made a lot of money who were dumb as a post, right? And, and you wouldn't necessarily want to let them uh, make a judgment on anything that affected your life. But Elon, very smart, no doubt about that. And, uh, you know, as, as we talked, the um, thing I liked the most about him was sense of humor. And uh, most people don't get his sense of humor. Uh, I think, you know, it's very dry. It's very sort of... Uh, Oh, nerdish, I guess, if you will. And, uh, but that was one of the things I, I always liked about him and, and, and we got along well with, and his ideas were big and I, and I loved, uh, and I still do. I love big ideas and it takes me probably a lot longer to warm up to them than, than he, he did. But, you know, he, as we established already, he's, he's been thinking about it most of his life. So, so, but I, I just didn't see the guy as transformative. I just didn't, I, I, I said, well, you know, he's a guy that, made a lot of money in the internet and uh, he wants to do all these things. And I remember uh, when I decided to leave SpaceX, you know, it was because I go back to the success thing. I wasn't really enjoying what I was. I wasn't really passionate about sending people to Mars. I'm still not, right. It's just not my thing. I, I think it's great. And, and it's just not what I want to do. And uh, so I felt like I owed it to Elon to not, you know, take up a seat on the bus that could be filled by somebody else that, that could really help him. So I, I'd done my part, and my part was a very early part where I, uh, you know, brought him in. I was the, I was the teacher, you know. I taught him about these things and uh, introduced him to people because that's what I do good at, at, in in life. I know a lot of people, and uh, I usually have a good judgment of who's the right fit for him and so on. So I helped him put the initial SpaceX team together and get it off. So so that that was kind of my talent, and honestly, didn't think the SpaceX would succeed. I really didn't. I didn't see some historical things that had to happen for him to succeed on that. And so this is really the other part of success that you have to uh, really think about is I, I call it being prepared to be lucky in Elon's case, you know, the shuttle retirement was nothing any, any of us saw. And in reality, SpaceX was having a real hard time getting by uh, without uh, the money that came from NASA to help them build a replacement for the shuttle, which became the Falcon 9 and the Dragon, which is now their workhorse and so on. So, so that uh, was a good deal for the taxpayers because it was you know something like a, a three quarters of a billion dollars to do that. Whereas, you know, NASA has been trying to replace the shuttle and they spent some somewhere north of fifty billion dollars and still don't have it. So, so you know, from from a taxpayer point of view, it was a good deal. But I couldn't see that coming. Uh, it was impossible for me to know that he would be that lucky right and uh so had i known that i probably would have stayed around a little longer because i could actually see building something and I, I didn't view spacex 
actually ever building anything. I thought it was going to be a paper exercise, which is precisely why I left. I, I, I just thought, okay, this is going to be a paper exercise. We're going to spend X amount of his money. He's going to get tired of it and he's going to move on. But that's where I was wrong. This guy, he, he never, ever gives up. He, he takes my determination of a racer and multiplies it by a hundred. You know, he, he, we never, ever give up in a race. You know, it's, it's like, you, you just keep cranking on it as hard as you can. You never crack open a beer and say, ah, it's done. You, you know, you just keep going and going and going until you can't go anymore. And that's Elon. And he, he's, he does that in spades. So you've been involved with building some world-class teams. So I'm interested, what are you looking for in the early days when you're first starting to build out that team? Well, great question. Um, I think I will tell you as an advance to answering it is my criteria has changed over time as I've learned. And, uh, I used to, in the early days, look for people who I thought were the high performers. And I, you know, you really have two axes that you're looking at, performance and trust. And um, in the early days, I, I, I uh, preferred performance over trust worthiness. And I think as my experience in life has gone on, um, I've done a, a little bit of a reversal on that. I emphasize trustworthiness over performance they, you know look at it this way a high performance high trustworthy person no brainer those those are the ones you want all of them um, the problem is if you have a high performance medium trustworthy person do you really want that <laughs> so uh, my life experience has said they can be very dangerous you have to be very careful about selecting those but a medium performance high trustworthy person is uh, a much better bet has been my experience as long as you, you know, you have some high performance, high trust people there. So I think teams built on trust are far more important than teams built on pure performance. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, something that the seal teams, I know practice, um, they, they look at team formation exactly the same way. And I think we can argue that the seal team, uh, mentality and the performance is, is just second to none in the world. And that says something. When building this team and it's early on, how do you even assess the trustworthiness of someone? I mean, I found trustworthiness almost comes out over time. Are there things yeah, you've does. discovered for early on? You know, y y yeah, you have to, um, you have to go with your gut instinct is really the, the thing. Um, and, I think there's a lot going back to that. We only use 10% of our brain. I think there's a lot of non verbal cues that we are deeply trained in our DNA to pick up on that. We override with our intellect and uh, that becomes what we call this gut sense of things. And uh, the, you know, what I tend to do and I was spending this weekend doing it, uh, prior to racing, um, was, was interviewing people and in, in an interview, that's sort of an artificial thing, but this was spending some social time with some, some key people. And for me, that's part of the interview. And I realize that in reverse, right? When I'm going out and raising money, they're doing the same thing to me. Um, and so they want to, want to find out about how your mind works. They want to, I want to find out about um, what kind of choices you make, what, what kinds of things are important to you, um, you know, how just even small things, right? Uh, like it, it can be small things as like, you know, is this the, the person that takes everything off the shared plates first? Do they leave anything? You know, there's just, there's a lot of different things. And, and uh, you, you just have to go with your gut sense on, on people. And, uh, in, in one case, you know, we, we just said, look, we just don't like this guy. You know, we, we, we think he's a high performer. Obviously, you look at that's that's very measurable. But the trustworthiness is really hard to measure, as you point out, without spending a lot of time with them. So there's obvious red flags, you know, uh, you know, people that uh, that are braggarts and, you know, ego problems or, you know, lies, you know, inconsistencies and things like that. Um, you know, some of that can be explained, but you know, there, there's obvious things there. So, you know, apart from that, um, yeah, you just, you just have to, you have to really, really talk to people. And, and it's funny, um, 
one of my new business partners, and I won't go into exactly what it is I'm doing, but uh, I found out that, uh, you know, his sister had passed away uh, unexpectedly in an auto accident, and uh, she left her son without a, um, a father. Uh, he was nowhere to be found, so no parents. So this uh, colleague of mine, he, uh, he, he adopted the, the, the boy and, uh, you know, totally disrupted his life. He didn't have any kids or anything and had a, a very nice girlfriend that didn't want him to adopt the boy. So he told the girlfriend to take a hike. So I just looked at that and I said, you know, those are the kind of values that I think are important to me. And that is a high trustworthy person. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, he's, he's, he's damn near my brother at this point. Yeah, I think you and I are looking through a, a similar lens. I, I use what's called a, a looking for a betterment reflex. And it's almost if I'm having an interview, call it at a, a coffee shop to see if they push in their chair, or pick up their trash, things of that nature. Yeah. And that, that obviously deals with spending time with the person. Have you found anything to assess that almost on paper prior to meeting, whether it be some type of test, personality test, anything of that nature that you found beneficial? No, not really. Um, you know, those personality tests, I've, I, I, look, I've had people that I would qualify as psychopaths pass those personality tests and uh, turn out to be some of the most abrasive, acidic people in an organization that I've ever, I've ever run into, you know, and I've been given those personality tests. I had, I had one guy, um, it was, a, it was a, it was a, a term sheet we got. And uh, again, I don't want to use names, but uh, they sent somebody from Paris to interview me and they spent a whole day with me in San Francisco. And uh, his whole goal was to come up with a profile of me and uh, <laughs> as the CEO. And, uh, you know, I went through, um, he dug up all the crap of my childhood and, you know, really dug in deep and that's all fine. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, he had, he had this sort of format he was using and, and he, he said, uh, I've determined that you are a Spanish conquistador. <laughs> and I, I, I about died laughing, you know. He said, well, you know, you like these big, you know, challenges and, you know, you're, you don't let anything get in your way. And, you know, but it, I just thought, what bullshit, you know. It, it just, it was just not effective. I think you just have to use your own gut instinct, really. And. This is this is really critically important because if you get it wrong, you are sunk. You know, I did a startup, and I think it was doomed from the day I started because I picked the wrong people. I just picked the wrong people. We were incompatible. So that it came apart, it came apart. You know, it, it was the forces uh, that that would never go away. You know, my first marriage was the same way. You know, I picked the wrong person, and the, the forces that I ignored that I knew. I knew when I was, you know, in my 20s, I, I knew this was not going to work, but I ignored it. I overrode my own instinct. It, it came back to bite me and be very expensive in the end. Yeah, setting that foundation early on is going to be one of the, the key factors there in, in eventual outcome. A minute ago, you were mentioning raising money, and I would just love to know how you go about that. And I'm not talking about the the X's and O's of it. I'm just thinking sure. about more of the, the higher level things that are going through your mind when raising money. Well, it's important to understand when you're raising money um, that there are various types of money out there, right? And, and the techniques vary a little bit between the types of money. But really, in the end, what you're doing is selling yourself. And, and it comes back to this team formation. These guys are literally going to be looking at you as if you are, uh, uh, you know, joining their team. You know, it's almost like joining a family. I, I, I say startups are, are like a marriage, and it's really true. Um, you know, and these guys looking to put significant amount, amounts of money into you or even insignificant amounts of money are going on gut instincts of you. So I have had so many investors tell me over and over and over and I, I'm an investor myself and I do the same thing if, if I have an instinct about the leader and I don't always need to meet the leader uh, I just made a recent investment where I didn't meet the guy I usually try to um, you know you go on that right because everything comes from the CEO down that's why some CEOs who say well I'm going to be the CEO I don't want to raise money or I've had people say hey can you come help us raise money uh, I had one, you know, recently say, why don't you come work for us and raise money? And 
So I don't know how to do that without being CEO. I, I just don't because that that's the that's the fundamental element of this whole thing is, is it's the CEO and the vision of the CEO that sells it. And, uh, you know, when you remove that, you got nothing to sell. So, so that, that's the thing to remember. And, and, you know, you gotta always remember also that what you're selling, people are discounting. <laughs> so it doesn't mean that you oversell, but I, and I hate people that oversell. I really do. Yeah. There are a lot of people, you know, that may, they may say, oh, well, you know, you do, but I really don't. I, I, I guess I probably am just very enthusiastic about how I believe in things. And uh, in my own mind, I'm not overselling the damn thing, but people are going to discount it, you know, so you've got to, you got to be aware of that. And so, you, you know, engineers sometimes are horrible salespeople because, you know, they want to tell you all the things that can go wrong when you're selling. Trust me, they're thinking about all the things that can go wrong. You don't need to you don't need to emphasize it. They expect you to highlight all the positive. So you got to stick with the script on that, you know, and that's where some people kind of get a little, um, uh, I don't know, uncomfortable with the process, right? Uh, it's not, it's not dishonest at all. It's just, it's just the, the human factor. So then that human factor, you mentioned not even meeting this recent CEO you invested in, what specifically did they do? That, that you entrusted them enough without meeting them face to face. He wrote a five million dollar check of his own to start the thing. A little skin in the game there, huh? Yeah, I mean, it, it, he wrote a hundred thousand dollar check. I'd have probably done the same thing, but I said, okay, five million dollar check. It's his third startup. I said, okay, and I, and, you know, I believed in in what he was doing. It wasn't just something. I only invest in things I understand, right? So, so I looked at this and said, yeah, I understand exactly where this is going. So fine. A few minutes ago, you mentioned a, a phrase I wrote down, and I, I keep looking back to "prepared to be lucky." Yeah. What, what What are you thinking when you say that? Well, we put it in simple terms and racing terms. Again, here we are back to racing. So, you know, when you're racing, you're, you're often somewhere in a pack of cars, and you're going through corners, and and you're sometimes falling very closely, sometimes not so closely. And uh, if you're prepared to be lucky in this case, somebody may spin out in front of you. And uh, if you're really paying attention to what's going on, you'll have thought this through. You'll have, you'll have pre-thought things that are happening. That's what I call prepared to be lucky. So, and I'm often doing this with cars. You know, again, you talk about mental capacity and you're, you're just thinking of all this stuff. You're watching this individual in front of you and you're seeing their weaknesses. And I'm studying the driver's weakness that I'm chasing. And, um, and, and I notice a tendency to go left or go right on this one play. So I've worked that through and say, well, he's, he's going to hook it and go left across the track. So I want to go right. And sure enough, that happens. And so that's called being prepared to be lucky to pass him and not hit him. So the outcome could, could, could be completely different if you weren't really paying attention and planning on it. Same is true in life. And uh, sometimes we just don't have enough time to prepare to be lucky. But, um, you know, a lot of people I know, walk around in life, you know, and, and they don't ever see a, uh, an opportunity as an opportunity. They see it as a, as a challenge, something they don't want to deal with. You know, if you, if you look at Elon, um, he was prepared to be lucky by having the, the shuttle retire and he jumped right on that and made good of it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's true in personal life. It's true in business. It, it's really this ability to, to recognize opportunity and, and to capitalize on it. So, you know, part of it's also discipline of, I call it keeping your powder dry. Um, you know, when I'm so busy, over busy with things, I have no, no uh, spare bandwidth. So I, I can't be lucky. You know, I can't, I can't capitalize on it. So, so it's, it's all of those things together. No, I, I absolutely love that. That's a, a very clear, concise framework you're working off of. You were just mentioning cars, and I, I'd love to wrap up there to, to take this full circle. So your car company, Vintage Exotics, what's the most exciting thing you're working on right there with them? Well, right now we're we're um, building our own car, <laughs> our own race car from the ground up, scratch. It's something I've always wanted to do in my life. Uh, I don't know that it'll be a, you know, a winner in the world, but it'll be my winner. And uh, it's a it's a personal milestone that I've always wanted to wanted to make. So, uh, but yeah, we've we've restored some some uh, pretty significant uh, historical race cars, and uh, 
you know, run a, run a race team that uh, does very well usually. And, uh, you know, very, very proud of that. And it's, uh, not really a hobby business, but it's a, uh, it's a nice little business that, uh, brings me an orthogonal experience to some of the space stuff I do. Yeah, I know. Very excited to, to see the, the final product there. So I know you mentioned that your new startup, you can't really dive into, but anything else you want the listeners to be aware of or anywhere you want them staying in touch with you? Yeah, just, just, uh, just know that I haven't given up on the space industry. I'm still very much a player in that. And, uh, I'm, uh, I think I'm going to uh, be very quiet about what I do over the next few few months, uh, just just to give it that extra element of surprise when you do find out. Great. Well, thanks so much for joining us on What Got You There. All right. Thank you. My pleasure. You guys made it to the end of another episode of What Got You There. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I really do appreciate you taking the time to listen all the way through. If you found value in this, the best way you can support the show is giving us a review, rating it, sharing it with your friends, and also sharing on social. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Looking forward to you guys listening to another episode.